Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad Chapter 20 Late in the evening I entered his study, after traversing an imposing but empty dining-room, very dimly lit. The house was silent. I was preceded by an elderly, grim Javanese servant in a sort of livery of white jacket and yellow sarong, who, after throwing the door open, exclaimed low, "'O oh, master!' and, stepping aside, vanished in a mysterious way, as though he had been a ghost only momentarily embodied for that particular service. Stein turned round with the chair, and, in the same movement, his spectacles seemed to get pushed up on his forehead. He welcomed me in his quiet and humorous voice. Only one corner of the vast room, the corner in which stood his writing-desk, was strongly lighted by a shaded reading-lamp, and the rest of the spacious apartment melted into shapeless gloom like a cavern. Narrow shelves filled with dark boxes of uniform shape and color ran round the walls, not from floor to ceiling, but in a somber belt about four feet broad. Catacombs of beetles! Wooden tablets were hung above at irregular intervals. The light reached one of them, and the word Coleoptera, written in gold letters, glittered mysteriously upon a vast dimness. The glass cases containing the collection of butterflies were ranged in three long rows upon slender-legged little tables. One of these cases had been removed from its place and stood on the desk, which was bestrewn with oblong slips of paper blackened with minute handwriting. "'So you see me. So,' he said. His hand hovered over the case— where a butterfly in solitary grandeur spread out dark bronze wings, seven inches or more across, with exquisite white veinings and a gorgeous border of yellow spots. Only one specimen like this they have in your London, and then no more. <laughs> to my small native town, this my collection I shall bequeath. Something of me, the best." He bent forward in the chair and gazed intently, his chin over the front of the case. I stood at his back. "'Marvellous,' he whispered, and seemed to forget my presence. His history was curious. He had been born in Bavaria, and when a youth of twenty-two had taken an active part in the revolutionary movement of 1848. Heavily compromised, he managed to make his escape, and at first found a refuge with a poor Republican watchmaker in Trieste. From there he made his way to Tripoli with a stock of cheap watches to hawk about. Not a very great opening, truly, but it turned out lucky enough, because it was there he came upon a Dutch traveller, a rather famous man, I believe, but I don't remember his name. It was that naturalist who, engaging him as a sort of assistant, took him to the east. They travelled the archipelago together and separately, collecting insects and birds for four years or more. Then the naturalist went home, and Stein, having no home to go to, remained with an old trader he had come across in his journeys in the interior of Celebes, if Celebes may be said to have an interior. This old Scotsman, the only white man allowed to reside in the country at the time, was a privileged friend of the chief ruler of Wajo States, who was a woman. I often heard Stein relate how that chap, who was slightly paralyzed on one side, had introduced him to the native court a short time before another stroke carried him off. He was a heavy man with a patriarchal white beard and of imposing stature. He came into the council hall, where all the rajas, panjarans, and headmen were assembled, with the queen, a fat, wrinkled woman, very free in her speech, Stein said, reclining on a high couch under a canopy. He dragged his leg, thumping with his stick, and grasped Stein's arm, leading him right up to the couch. "'Look, queen, and your rajas, this is my son.' he proclaimed in a stentorian voice. I have traded with your fathers, and when I die he shall trade with you and your sons. 
By means of this simple formality, Stein inherited the Scotsman's privileged position and all his stock in trade, together with a fortified house on the banks of the only navigable river in the country. Shortly afterwards, the old queen, who was so free in her speech, died, and the country became disturbed by various pretenders to the throne. Stein joined the party of a younger son, the one whom thirty years later he never spoke of otherwise but as my poor Mohammed Bonso. They both became the heroes of innumerable exploits, they had wonderful adventures, and once stood a siege in the Scotsman's house for a month, with only a score of followers against a whole army. I believe the natives talk of that war to this day. Uh, meantime, it seems, Stein never failed to annex to his own account every butterfly or beetle he could lay his hands on. After some eight years of war, negotiations, false truces, sudden outbreaks, reconciliation, treachery, and so on, and just as peace seemed at last permanently established, his poor Mohammed Bonso was assassinated at the gate of his own royal residence, while dismounting in the highest spirits on the return from a successful deer hunt. This event rendered Stein's position extremely insecure, but he would have stayed, perhaps, had it not been that a short time afterwards he lost Mohammed's sister. My dear wife, the princess, he used to say solemnly, by whom he had had a daughter, mother and child both dying within three days of each other from some infectious fever. He left the country which this cruel loss had made unbearable to him. Thus ended the first and adventurous part of his existence. What followed was so different that but for the reality of sorrow which remained with him, this strange part must have resembled a dream. He had a little money, he started life afresh, and in the course of years acquired a considerable fortune. At first he had travelled a good deal amongst the islands, but age had stolen upon him, and of late he seldom left his spacious house three miles out of town with an extensive garden, and surrounded by stables, offices, and bamboo cottages for his servants and dependents, of whom he had many. He drove in his buggy every morning to town, where he had an office with white and Chinese clerks. He owned a small fleet of schooners and native craft, and dealt in island produce on a large scale. For the rest he lived solitary, but not misanthropic, with his books in his collection, classing and arranging specimens, corresponding with entomologists in Europe, writing up a descriptive catalogue of his treasures. Such was the history of the man whom I had come to consult upon Jim's case, without any definite hope, simply to hear what he would have to say would have been a relief. I was very anxious, but I respected the intense almost passionate absorption with which he looked at a butterfly, as though on the bronze sheen of these frail wings, in the white tracings, in the gorgeous markings, he could see other things, an image of something as perishable and defying destruction as these delicate and lifeless tissues displaying a splendor unmarred by death. Marvelous, he repeated, looking up at me. Look! The beauty, but that is nothing. Look at the accuracy, the harmony, and so fragile, and so strong, and so exact. This is nature, the balance of colossal forces. Every star is so, and every blade of grass stands so, and the mighty cosmos in perfect equilibrium produces this. This wonder, this masterpiece of nature, the great artist. Never heard an entomologist go on like this, I observed cheerfully. Masterpiece? And what of man? Man is amazing, but he is not a masterpiece, he said, keeping his eyes fixed on the glass case. Perhaps the artist was a little mad, eh? <laughs> what do you think? 
Sometimes it seems to me that man is come where he is not wanted, where there is no place for him. For if not, why should he want all the place? Why should he run about here and there, making a great noise about himself, talking about the stars, disturbing the blades of grass, catching butterflies, I chimed in. He smiled, threw himself back in his chair, and stretched his legs. Sit down, he said. I captured this rare specimen myself one very fine morning, and I had a very big emotion. You don't know what it is for a collector to capture such a rare specimen. You can't know. I smiled at my ease in a rocking chair. His eyes seemed to look far beyond the wall at which they stared, and he narrated how one night a messenger arrived from his poor Mohammed, requiring his presence at the residence, as he called it, which was distant some nine or ten miles by a bridle path over a cultivated plain, with patches of forest here and there. Early in the morning he started from his fortified house, after embracing his little Emma, and leaving the princess, his wife, in command. He described how she came with him as far as the gate, walking with one hand on the neck of his horse. She had on a white jacket, gold pins in her hair, and a brown leather belt over her left shoulder with a revolver in it. She talked as women will talk, he said, telling me to be careful and to try to get back before dark, and what a great wickedness it was for me to go alone. We were at war, and the country was not safe. My men were putting up bulletproof shutters to the house and loading their rifles, and she begged me to have no fear for her. She could defend the house against anybody till I returned, and I laughed with pleasure a little. I liked to see her so brave and young and strong. I was young, too, then. At the gate she caught hold of my hand and gave it one squeeze and fell back. I made my horse stand still outside till I heard the bars of the gate put up behind me. There was a great enemy of mine, a great noble, and a great rascal, too, roaming with a band in the neighborhood. I cantered four or five miles. There had been rain in the night, but the mists had gone up, up, and the face of the earth was clean. It lay smiling at me, so fresh and innocent— like a little child. Uh, suddenly somebody fires a volley, twenty shots at least, it seemed to me. I hear bullets sing in my ear, and my hat jumps to the back of my head. It was a little intrigue, you understand. They got my poor Mohammed to send for me, and then laid that ambush. I see it all in a minute, and I think, this wants a little management. My pony snort, jump, and stand, and I fall slowly forward with my head on his mane. He begins to walk, and with one eye I could see over his neck a faint cloud of smoke hanging in front of a clump of bamboos to my left. I think, aha, my friends, why you not wait long enough before you shoot? This is not yet Gelungen. <laughs> oh, no. I get hold of my revolver with my right hand. Quiet, quiet. After all, there were only seven of these rascals. They get up from the grass and start running with their sarongs tucked up, waving spears above their head and yelling to each other to look out and catch the horse, because I was dead. I let them come as close as the door here, and then bang, bang, bang. Take aim each time, too. One more shot I fire at a man's back, but I miss. Too far already. And then I sit alone on my horse, with the clean earth smiling at me, and there are the bodies of three men lying on the ground. One was curled up like a dog. Another on his back had an arm over his eyes, as if to keep off the sun, and the third man, he draws up his leg very slowly, and makes it with one kick straight again. I watch him very carefully from my horse, but there is no more. Bleibt ganz ruhig, uh, keep still, so. 
and as I looked at his face for some sign of life, I observed something like a faint shadow pass over his forehead. It was the shadow of this butterfly. Look at the form of the wing. This species fly high with a strong flight. I raised my eyes, and I saw him fluttering away. I think, can it be possible? And then I lost him. I dismounted and went on very slow, leading my horse and holding my revolver with one hand, and my eyes darting up and down and right and left everywhere. At last I saw him sitting on a small heap of dirt ten feet away. At once my heart began to beat quick. I let go my horse, keep my revolver in one hand, and with the other snatch my soft felt hat off my head. One step, steady, another step, flop, I got him. When I got up, I shook like a leaf with excitement, and when I opened up these beautiful wings and made sure what a rare and so extraordinarily perfect specimen I had, my head went round and my legs became so weak with emotion that I had to sit on the ground. I had greatly desired to possess myself of a specimen of that species when collecting for the professor. I took long journeys and underwent great privations. I had dreamed of him in my sleep, and here suddenly I had him in my fingers for myself. In the words of the poet, he pronounced it Boet, So halt ich endlich dein in meinen Handen, und nenn es in gewissen Sinne mine. He gave to the last word the emphasis of a suddenly lowered voice, and withdrew his eyes slowly from my face. He began to charge a long-stemmed pipe busily and in silence, then, pausing with his thumb on the orifice of the bowl, looked at me again significantly. Yes, my good friend, on that day I had nothing to desire. I had greatly annoyed my principal enemy. I was young, strong. I had friendship. I had the love, he said love, of a woman. A child I had to make my heart very full. And even what I had once dreamed in my sleep had come into my hands, too. He struck a match which flared violently. His thoughtful, placid face twitched once. Friend, wife, child, he said slowly, gazing at the small flame. <sighs> the match was blown out. He sighed and turned again to the glass case. The frail and beautiful wings quivered faintly, as if his breath had for an instant called back to life that gorgeous object of his dreams. The work, he began suddenly, pointing to the scattered slips, and in his usual gentle and cheery tone, is making great progress. I have been this rare specimen describing. Now, now, what is your good news? To tell you the truth, Stein, I said with an effort that surprised me, I came here to describe a specimen. Butterfly! he asked, with an unbelieving and humorous eagerness. "'Nothing so perfect,' I answered, feeling suddenly dispirited with all sorts of doubts. "'A man!' "'Ah, so,' he murmured, and his smiling countenance turned to me became grave. Then, after looking at me for a while, he said slowly, "'Well, I am a man, too.' Here you have him as he was. He knew how to be so generously encouraging as to make a scrupulous man hesitate on the brink of confidence. But if I did hesitate, it was not for long. He heard me out, sitting with crossed legs. Sometimes his head would disappear completely in a great eruption of smoke, and a sympathetic growl would come out from the cloud. When I finished, he uncrossed his legs— laid down his pipe, leaned forward towards me earnestly, with his elbows on the arms of his chair, the tips of his fingers together. "'I understand very well. He is romantic.' 
he had diagnosed the case for me, and at first I was quite startled to find out how simple it was. And, indeed, our conference resembled so much a medical consultation, Stein, of learned aspect, sitting in an armchair before his desk, I, anxious, in another, facing him, but a little to one side, that it seemed natural to ask, "'What's good for it?' He lifted up a long forefinger. "'There is only one remedy. One thing alone can us from being ourselves cure.' The finger came down on the desk with a smart rap. The case which he had made to look so simple before became, if possible, still simpler, and altogether hopeless. There was a pause. Yes, said I. Strictly speaking, the question is not how to get cured, but how to live. He approved with his head, a little sadly as it seemed. Ya, yeah, ya. Yeah. In general, adapting the words of your great poet, that is the question. He went on, nodding sympathetically. How to be. Ah, how to be. He stood up with the tips of his fingers resting on the desk. We want in so many different ways to be, he began again. This magnificent butterfly finds a little heap of dirt and sits still on it. But man, he will never on his heap of mud keep still. He wants to be so, and again he wants to be so. He moved his hand up, then down. He wants to be a saint, and he wants to be a devil. And every time he shuts his eyes, he sees himself as a very fine fellow. So fine as he can never be in a dream. He lowered the glass lid. The automatic lock clicked sharply, and, taking up the case in both hands, he bore it religiously away to its place, passing out of the bright circle of the lamp into the ring of fainter light, into the shapeless dusk at last. It had an odd effect, as if these few steps had carried him out of this concrete and perplexed world. His tall form, as though robbed of its substance, hovered noiselessly over invisible things, with stooping and indefinite movements. His voice, heard in that remoteness where he could be glimpsed mysteriously busy with immaterial cares, was no longer incisive, seemed to roll voluminous and grave, mellowed by distance. "'And because you not always can keep your eyes shut,' There comes the real trouble, the heart pain, the world pain. I tell you, my friend, it is not good for you to find you cannot make your dream come true, for the reason that you are not strong enough, or not clever enough. Yeah. And all the time you are such a fine fellow, too. We? Was? Gott in Himmel! How can that be? <laughs> The shadow, prowling amongst the graves of butterflies, laughed boisterously. Yes, very funny this terrible thing is. A man that is born falls into a dream, like a man who falls into the sea. If he tries to climb out into the air, as inexperienced people endeavor to do, he drowns. Nick Var? No, I tell you. The way is to the destructive element submit yourself, and with the exertions of your hand and feet in the water, make the deep, deep sea keep you up. So, if you ask me how to be, his voice leaped up extraordinarily strong, as though away there in the dusk he had been inspired by some whisper of knowledge. I will tell you. For that, too, there is only one way. With a hasty swish-swish of his slippers, he loomed up in the ring of faint light, and suddenly appeared in the bright circle of the lamp, his extended hand aimed at my breast like a pistol. His deep-set eyes seemed to pierce through me, but his twitching lips uttered no word, and the austere exultation of a certitude seen in the dusk 
vanished from his face. The hand that had been pointing at my breast fell, and by and by, coming a step nearer, he laid it gently on my shoulder. There were things, he said mournfully, that perhaps could never be told. Only he had lived so much alone that sometimes he forgot. He forgot. The light had destroyed the assurance which had inspired him in the distant shadows. He sat down, and with both elbows on the desk, rubbed his forehead. And yet it is true. It is true. In the destructive element, immerse. He spoke in a subdued tone, without looking at me, one hand on each side of his face. That was the way, to follow the dream, and again to follow the dream, and so, evig, usque ad finem. The whisper of his conviction seemed to open before me a vast and uncertain expanse, as of a crepuscular horizon on a plain at dawn, or was it, perchance, the coming of the night? One had not the courage to decide, but it was a charming and deceptive light, throwing the impalpable poesy of its dimness over pitfalls, over graves. His life had begun in sacrifice, in enthusiasm for generous ideas. He had travelled very far on various ways, on strange paths, and whatever he followed it had been without faltering— and therefore without shame and without regret. In so far he was right, that was the way, no doubt. Yet for all that, the great plain on which men wander amongst graves and pitfalls remained very desolate under the impalpable poesy of its crepuscular light, overshadowed in the centre, circled with a bright edge, as if surrounded by an abyss full of frames, when at last I broke the silence, it was to express the opinion that no one could be more romantic than himself. He shook his head slowly, and afterwards looked at me with a patient and inquiring glance. It was a shame, he said. There we were, sitting and talking like two boys, instead of putting our heads together to find something practical, a practical remedy for the evil— for the great evil, he repeated, with a humorous and indulgent smile. For all that, our talk did not grow more practical. We avoided pronouncing Jim's name as though we had tried to keep flesh and blood out of our discussion, or he were nothing but an erring spirit, a suffering and nameless shade. Nah, said Stein, rising. Tonight you sleep here, and in the morning we shall do something practical practical. He lit a two-branched candlestick and led the way. We passed through empty, dark rooms, escorted by gleams from the lights Stein carried. They glided along the waxed floors, sweeping here and there over the polished surface of a table, leaped upon a fragmentary curve of a piece of furniture, or flashed perpendicularly in and out of distant mirrors while the forms of two men and the flicker of two flames could be seen for a moment stealing silently across the depths of a crystalline void. He walked slowly a pace in advance with stooping courtesy. There was a profound, as it were, a listening quietude on his face. The long flaxen locks, mixed with white threads, were scattered thinly upon his slightly bowed neck. He is romantic, romantic, he repeated, and that is very bad, very bad. Very good, too, he added. But is he? I queried. Gewiss, he said, and stood still, holding up the candelabrum, but without looking at me. Evident! What is it that by inward pain makes him know himself? What is it that for you and me makes him exist? At that moment it was difficult to believe in Jim's existence. Starting from a country parsonage, blurred by crowds of men as by clouds of dust, silenced by the clashing claims of life and death in a material world, 
but his imperishable reality came to me with a convincing, with an irresistible force. I saw it vividly, as though in our progress through the lofty, silent rooms, amongst fleeting gleams of light, and the sudden revelations of human figures stealing with flickering flames within unfathomable and pellucid depths, we had approached nearer to absolute truth, which, like beauty itself, floats elusive, obscure, half-submerged in the silent, still waters of mystery. Perhaps he is. I admitted, with a slight laugh, whose unexpectedly loud reverberation made me lower my voice directly. But I am sure you are. With his head dropping on his breast and the light held high, he began to walk again. Well, I exist too, he said. He preceded me. My eyes followed his movements, but what I did see was not the head of the firm, the welcome guest at afternoon receptions, the correspondent of learned societies, the entertainer of stray naturalists. I saw only the reality of his destiny, which he had known how to follow with unfaltering footsteps, that life begun in humble surroundings, rich and generous enthusiasms in friendship, love, war, in all the exalted elements of romance. At the door of my room he faced me. Yes, I said, as though carrying on a discussion, and amongst other things you dreamed foolishly of a certain butterfly. But when one fine morning your dream came in your way, you did not let the splendid opportunity escape, did you? Whereas he... Stein lifted his hand. And do you know how many opportunities I let escape? How many dreams I had lost that had come in my way? He shook his head regretfully. It seems to me that some would have been very fine if I had made them come true. Do you know how many... Perhaps I myself don't know. Whether his were fine or not, I said, he knows of one which he certainly did not catch. Everybody knows of one or two like that, said Stein, and that is the trouble, the great trouble. He shook hands on the threshold, peered into my room under his raised arm. Sleep well. On tomorrow we must do something practical. Practical. Though his own room was beyond mine, I saw him return the way he came. He was going back to his butterflies. End of chapter 20